Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and in the information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by, help nav by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services and help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar today, and, I hope, and we hope that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems, science, and technology. Before we get started today, I'd like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they are posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csi.org forward slash webinars and you can find today's webinars. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, um, it will say to view the webinar PDF, click here. Uh, secondly, all participants are muted. Uh, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can use that to chat with each other, and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you have a question uh, for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tools at the top center of your screen. Uh, that's the little icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I will read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. With that said, I'll hand it off to today's presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, my, let me turn on my camera. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Uh, my name is Wen Zhu. I am from NIRA. Uh, today, we'll be talking about an effort we're doing with the uh, Department of Defense Technical, uh, more in particular, Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, to use blockchain technologies to secure dissemination of document within the defense research, development, test, and evaluation community. The agency that supports this effort, DTIC, is the custodian of defense research and engineering data. In that role, DTIC maintains a variety of data sets, ranging from public accessible information like budget information from Congress to proprietary information such as research proposals, technical reports. Some are public accessible and others are of sensitive nature because they could be either classified or controlled unclassified information. In doing that, DTIC obviously collaborate with uh, organizations within DOD and outside. That includes industry partners like us, NERA, who actually submit technical reports uh, and other documents to DTIC. So we need to securely support secure collaboration within this community by allowing documents to be shared securely and effectively. So what kind of problem are we trying to address? Um, we have a lot of document repository solutions today, uh, commercially available, custom developed, and they have provided some sort of access control to the document repository. But one of the issues is whatever security you put in when user log into a repository and present their information, you essentially lose this, the ability to control that document once the document is downloaded to the user's desktop. We call this the lack of continual access control. Uh, for example, if I'm a DTIC user, I go to DTIC repository, I log in, I can only see the information I'm allowed to see, but then I download the document. At that point, I am free to 
make changes to the document and forward to another person. And that person is going to be, um, it's going to be very hard for that person to tell whether that document has been altered or not. Or I could send that document as an email attachment to another recipient. And whoever I decide to send this to will have access to that information, regardless of whether that person authorized or not. So the doc, so, you know, we want to do the first and foremost objective is to I, I got a message saying lost sound. I, I'm hoping I'm okay. All right. Uh, so the first and foremost um, objective and, and problem I'm trying to address is providing continual access control associated with the document. Second is prevent accidental leaking of information. We have all have the cases where we attach a document to an email and send to somebody and realize that's the wrong recipient. At that point, we have no way to recall that document. We want to fix that. We want to be able to set an expiration date for that document, or we want to be able to click a button and recall that document, even though that has left our enclave. Um, the third point we're trying to address is the lack of insight into how the document is used. In a community such as defense research, um, development, testing, evaluation, the question people always ask is, you know, we have seen technology breakthroughs like internet, like the GPS, but what kind of collaboration has led to those kind of technology breakthroughs? It's hard to know because we don't know what kind of collaboration happened. Uh, we don't know what kind of document trail that happened that to enable that kind of breakthrough in technology development. So what we want to do is to be able to see insight into distribution, see cluster collaboration, see paths of dissemination, so we can get insight about how the technology is used. And finally, is resiliency of information here. People um, ask the question about, you know, I use cloud, I use distributed computing, I distribute my data into multiple servers. That provides me some sort of resiliency. Yes, it does. Uh, in that sense, we are, you're protecting against is a failure of a single information system. However, whatever distributed infrastructure you have, you're still subject to the same IT administration. That is why if somebody can compromise your um, system administrator's password, that person will pretty much have a free you know, a pass of roam around your enterprise network. So we want to be able to add another layer of resiliency to guard against that the enterprise system administration is breached in the case of hacking or malware or whatnot. So those are the uh, four primary address, uh, problem we're trying to address with this development here. One of the technologies we're looking at is blockchain. Uh, blockchain has been used in both commercial and uh, um, government for a variety of purposes. And we use blockchain for really four different reasons. First is the availability and scalability attribute of this technology. If you look at um, you know, global chain-based framework, whether it's um, um, supply chain management, whether it's information sharing between trade partners, you realize that we really achieve unprecedented uh, availability and scalability by distributing the computing, the data, and the governance across multiple copies of the same data and multiple instances of the same execution environment. So we're achieving, we're removing any single point of failure in that entire network. Second thing we're looking at for blockchain is the ability to preserve logging and other trail. The, the foundation of blockchain technology is immutable ledgers. Um, by maintaining the temporary resistant logging across different instances of ledger, we can be certain that the audit trail of any transaction is probably logged and preserved. The third point I want to address is the execution of smart contract across different organizations using blockchain. Um, you know, I'm a technologist. Some, sometimes I feel this is an underappreciated attribute of blockchain because the ability of defining policies and enforcing them uniformly as smart contract at different organizations 
is really a, a you know a, a, the ability provided by blockchain technologies. If you think about it, smart contracts are collected and maintained by different organizations. You can assure that their logic is transparent to everybody. The execution is validated by multiple parties. So that really ensures uniform policy uh, enforcement across different organizations. The final point of using blockchain is supporting a mixed trust environment here. Um, as I alluded earlier in the presentation, we really have a environment where we have government agencies, we have collaborators in the industry, academia, and whatnot, and we have different level of trust exist among these organizations. Blockchain is naturally designed for that kind of environment. Think about Bitcoin, right? Everybody talking about Bitcoin, enabling transactions uh, between people who don't know, know and trust each other. And that's kind of the attribute we're looking for. So scalability, temporary disk logging, execution of smart contract across organizations, and supporting a various level of trust. Those are some of the attributes that led us to using blockchain technologies to design this infrastructure for supporting dissemination of document within the defense RDTNE community. So I am actually gonna show a demo here about the technology we developed here. Uh, in this demo scenario, you're gonna see four scenarios here. Initially, somebody would submit a document to a repository, for example, DTAG repository. Um, in, during that submission time, certain policies is created and associated with that document. And then some registered users with a username and password is going to log into that repository and download a file, a document for their personal use. And then what you're going to see is that person do what we all do, send that document to colleagues for further review, for example. Now, in that case, you're going to see a forwarding to an authorized user who is actually not a user of the repository, right? So now we have the access control of that document for that user, even though that user is not a user of repository. And you also see a case where a attempt is made to send a document to an unauthorized user here. So I am going to switch to a demo here. And this is what I always say before demo here. So first, um, you know, this is a, uh, a live system. So uh, if there are any hiccups, apologize in advance. And second is that um, we really have focused on the UI tech, I mean, the, the technologies underneath this dissemination. So this is not the previous UI you see, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll improve that later. So what you're looking at is a simple repository we have built, a, a simple standalone document repository. So it has some basic features like a submitter will submit a document, somebody will download it, then we have a, some, some screen for an administrator to come in and monitor the distribution of the documents here. So we start by submitting a document. This is a, a simple task. A submitter comes in and select a PDF document here and trying to submit to the repository here. This is where the policies is associated with the document here. As you can see, some basic document metadata is here, such as you know, author and title, but you can also specify specific policies for organizations. That means if I'm sending a user to DTIC, a DTIC user, I can have a set of policies that's different from a general user. So that's what I'm gonna do with this document. So we're gonna say that by default, we're not gonna allow anyone to access document, except if you are affiliated with DTIC. In which case, we're actually gonna have a expiration time uh, of that document. So you download this after a few minutes and this document expires, you can't really use it anymore. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set the expiration time to 0 0.02 seconds, I mean, days, um, you know, just to, you know, if you calculate and add them enough demo for this, uh, it's about three minutes. So after three minutes of downloading this document, the document should expire. I'm doing this simply, we can demonstrate that. You can also, of course, have other things like specific date for expiration, which will skip for this demo. So now we're publishing this document. Um, this is the policy here for the document. And there we go. So let's go back to demo home. So the document has been submitted. 
Now I am a user. I'm coming in. I'm the login to the detail repository. So um, obviously we have a variety of ways of logging in. You can use a smart card, your credentials. But for demonstration purposes, I have built a list of predefined users here. So I'm just gonna select one of them. Uh, this is detail user, Joe. All right, so Joe's gonna come in and log in. Surely this is uh, the document we just uh, uh, submitted here. If you look at the details, you can see that it has policies designed for specific users. Uh, for DTIC, for example. So that's the DTIC specific policies right here. So what we're going to do is Joe is registered user. He's going to download for his person use here. So we're going to just download this document. Now, as you can see here, what is being downloaded is a standard HTML file that Joe can bring up in his browser. So this is the classic HTML file here. Um, and again, in order to access this document, which is local to Joe's computer, Joe needs to put in the credential. So what Joe does is, you know, we can do the digital certificate, but for now, again, for demo purposes, I'm just going to select a predefined user right here. So now Joe's credential is being validated, and you can see the document is authorized here. Um, this is a, a document that has been submitted. We're looking at a full rendering of PDF content within the browser. Um, so you can do what you normally do with any PDF content, like search for stuff. Uh, you can do, you know, zoom in, zoom out uh, of different things here. And what I want to point out here is, if you recall, in our um, security configuration, we have said that we're going to put a um, watermark here. That is a watermark here. And, and it shows that this document is for Joe only. Just by having this watermark, even not for other access control policy enforcement, having this watermark helps preventing um, accidental leaking information because this is a uh, warning to anybody who's not accessed this um, legally. So, and another thing you can see here is um, you can, Joe can be assured when he opens this document that this document is from a third source. It is signed by a, by a person that he trusts, presumably. And uh, um, if he wants to, he can actually open the digital certificate and look at that person to make sure that this is somebody that he trusts. So that is the first use case, uh, you know, authorize the user of the repository downloading a document for his use. So now Joe really likes this document. Um, he does everybody, you know, all we do is to, he's gonna forward this to a colleague. A detail colleague Charlie. So what he does is, you know, he this is a HTML file on his desktop. He's you know, opening an email, assuming you know, attach the email to to, uh, to a message, and then send this document to Charlie. So now, assuming Charlie got this document, and Charlie is going to open this document in his browser on his laptop. So for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to reload this document right here. Okay. So assuming now I'm coming as Charlie. So you can see that the first thing it does is prompt a user for a username and password, I mean, for a credential. So uh, so now I'm a Charlie, so I'm going to come in. Um, and because that document, if you remember, was packaged especially for Joe, Charlie is not the author user for it. So now what Charlie does is Charlie can request his own copy of that document. So now so Charlie click on request access. You can see a document, another HTML is created just for Charlie. So now Charlie can come in and look at this document. Oh, I'm not selecting one. So um, you can see that this is a new document being created for Charlie with a new expression time, which is three minutes from the current time. So now you see in a case where Joe has forwarded a document to authorized user. What happens if you come back to Joe's document and Joe decides to forward to another user who's not authorized? Let's see. So let's say Joe in this case want to forward to a newer user, Claire. So let's see. So Claire again opens the document Joe just forwarded. She's gonna log in with her credentials right here. She's going to request access. 
And you're going to see that uh, she is not authorized to access that. So because our policy specify that only DTEC users can access the document, and we decide, we, we determine who's a DTEC user, or the general affiliation of a user based on the certificate that they present in this case. So now let's go back to um, Charlie's document. Right now it's 1220. Uh, so I think the Charlie's document should have expired. So now I'm Charlie, let's, let's come back to it, see what happens here. You can see that this document is no longer accessible to Charlie because we set a three minute expiration time for this document. Just to summarize what we have done so far, we've seen a case where Charlie as the, I'm sorry, Joe as the author of the user coming into the repository and try to download the document for his use. Then he forwards to two colleagues, Charlie, who's authorized because he's a DTIC user, and Claire, who's not authorized because she is not with DTIC. And the system was able to look at the recipient's credentials and make proper access control decisions based on that. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna go back to the document repository here and show a different aspect of um, the, the solution here, which is monitoring and getting insight of distribution. So we're going in here. This is a screen where an administrator can come in and look at all the document uh, distributed from the repository or look at a specific user and find their activities here. So let's come in and list all the documents here. Uh, the last item here, which is document we just added and submitted here. So let's look at that. Um, you can see the paths for distribution here. It started with um, publish of document on the repository. Then initial distribution is to Joe. Joe forwards this to author user, Charlie. And that is a path of dissemination that we see. So, um, and there are other documents that in the repository you can see that have more um, complex dissemination paths here. If we want to follow the path of dissemination, we can look at individual users and see their activities in the system here. For example, now I'm looking at Joe. This, this has all the documents Joe has downloaded. And I'm gonna zoom this in a little bit here. Um, Joe has downloaded here, and so somehow he downloaded, then he forwarded this to other users so we can follow the chain of document distribution and see exactly what happens by each individual users to each individual document, All right? So now let's, um, so we're going to hide, hide the graph, um, see here. So this is another textual view of what happens to each of the document here. Uh, this is our new document we just done. You can see this is download, um, this is Charlie, and this is sent by Joe to him. So now if we determine that this is something we send by accident, we can click this button, and that actually invalidate the recipient access to this document here. If I go back to uh, Charlie, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the wrong thing. If I go back to Joe's document, you can see this particular document right here. Uh, okay, this, I think this is this one. So this is just recalled here. So this is Joe's document forwarded to Charlie, and it has been just recalled here. And this is a list of events just happened to that document, you can see. This shows uh, where the document came from, from the um, origin distribution, the sender, the recipient, when the document is accessed, when the document is recalled here. So you can have a list of um, transactions associated with that document at any given time by any given user here. So I am gonna, you know, for some of the other document, uh, there are more dissemination paths that's more interesting that you can actually look at. For example, I can look at uh, some failed access attempt here. Now, for this particular document, it was the intended for Dan, but you know, two other users, Claire and Alan, actually tried to access unsuccessfully. So those are the things we can do with this monitoring utility here. All right. So that concludes the demonstration of the 
technology. So I'm going back to the briefing here. So you have seen a bunch of files and browser content here. So what exactly is done behind the scene here? I think there are two important technology uh, we should point out. First is blockchain. Now serving as a authoritative source for metadata for a transaction for access control. Another is digital rights management. Um, the example, the parallel I would draw between what we do uh, with is what we do between what we do and what Apple does. If you think what you know Apple does, Apple is basically trying to sell their music to people. What they want to do is to ensure that their music is only played based on the license terms and you only play the music that you bought. We're trying to do the same thing, except we're trying to do with document. We're trying to make sure that you only access document with the, uh, the document you have access to and only in accordance with the document access policy that is uh, specified for that document. But from a technology standpoint, the music uh, enforcement, policy enforcement has a benefit has a, because you always have a player, whether it's like iTunes player, whether it's a um, Google Music player. So that client can be used to enforce the music uh, access policy at the device, but we don't have that. That is why you see that we're using standard and open source technologies like HTML, like JavaScript to add, really embed that policy in the document itself and distribute and enforce that policy locally at the user's browser. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that we are leveraging cloud technologies. Um, so in particular, we're using both infrastructure as a service as well as platform as a service. So we have standard instances provisioned from public cloud providers. Then we also use managed blockchain instances. Um, so there are some interesting lessons learned that I'm happy to share that with uh, people who are interested in this. A, a note on security. One of the reasons we decide to use blockchain technologies is that if you look at this technology, it really has zero trust built in at every layer of the infrastructure. At the bottom, you have the blockchain node. They are actually you know, devices and computers sitting on your network. So there you have the standard network access policies to really secure access to that particular instance of the uh, blockchain node. But above that, there are two layers essentially provided by the blockchain platform itself. First is ledger. Ledger is where all the transactions, all the data is logged. That is all the distribution uh, metadata is maintained in our application. That is where all the trails are maintained in our application. So um, by having different peers maintaining these different uh, transactions on, in the ledger that we can, we can assure that people, uh, th these transactions are secure and they are um, auditable and the other trails maintained. Moving above that, um, you have different transactions. These transactions are signed by different organizations. In this case, what I had was three different users associated with three different organizations. Each of them would maintain their own um, infrastructure, yet they can share um, data because the transactions are signed uh, by their authoritative administrators using a PKI. Finally, we have a layer of security built on top of the application. So one thing you see here is that um, a user comes in and look at the document. So the blockchain instance we're using is a what they call permission blockchain, in which case only authorized partners can access the blockchain. For example, DTIC, for example, DTIC agencies, for example, industry partners. But beyond that, we also need to build a layer of um, Security based on based on users' identities. You've seen Joe, you've seen Charlie, you've seen um, Claire. The three users all each have their own access privilege, access rights, and that was enforced. So we had to build that layer on top of that. 
Um, so this 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 layered diagram really shows you that we're leveraging the infrastructure, the building capability of blockchain technologies, as well as adding on top of that by enforcing user specific policies. And that really has a model that conforms with the zero trust principles. So what we'll do next, another problem we're looking at is um, ransomware protection. If you read the news, there are you know, quite a few recent ransomware attacks on critical infrastructure, on um, food processors we have, on the oil gas pipelines we have, and that has caused great disruptions in business and economy. So what we're trying to say is that, can we use the same blockchain technologies to address that? In particular, can we use blockchains to control access to critical resources? Can we use distributed file systems to ensure that file can be uh, securely backed up and uh, quickly recovered in the case of attack? Can we maintain privacy confidentiality of the content? Because now if you're talking about file, if you're talking about distributed infrastructure, now you're talking about people, organizations, storing the physical content on a distributed framework and with possibility of having this outside their organization. How do we ensure privacy and confidentiality of that content? Those are some of the issues we're actually looking at right now. And we have um, a high level approach we have a look at and determine. So we're trying to see whether this technology can be extended to address that challenge. So I'm going to summarize here um, the three things, the benefit we're providing with this technology. First is we're enabling sharing on Teams. For example, uh, you've seen the visibility provided by this technology. We've seen how collaboration is done in the community. We see how information is used in the community. Uh, we are ensuring information consistency. You know, when Joe opens this document, he is sure that this document is from a third source he trusts. Second is we're enabling collaboration with partners by having that zero privacy here. As I mentioned here, we have access control built at every architecture layers. We also use PKI to verify uh, transactions and other data to ensure that uh, the system is secure and information protected. Finally, by providing resiliency of infrastructure, by distributing data, logic, smart contract across different organizations under different governance, uh, we are actually um, provide another layer of resiliency to AI infrastructure to protect from attack from adversaries and uh, uh, hackers here. So that is the three, uh, three benefits we're hoping to achieve with this technology here. That actually concludes my prepared presentation. I am ready for any questions I may have. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, very interesting work on uh, transforming the technology. Um, before we get into the Q&A, um, feel free to submit your questions um, using the audience questions um, link right at the top of the screen. Um, if it's in the attendee chat, we'll also get to that as well. Um, before I go to the audience questions, um, this is a current effort under DTIC. Uh, when, if you if you could possibly, can you just let us know what the current status is of this project? I believe it it is a current uh, cyber under DTIC. Is that correct? Yes, this is a current effort of cyber phase two. Okay, cyber phase two. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, um, so we do have some questions that came in the attendee chat, so I'll, I'll read those aloud before we get into uh, into the Q and A. Um, so. Okay, Chuck actually just submitted. So we do have a question from James Bourne. He says, are the files stored on or off ledger? Um, right now, you have seen is the, the document is actually stored off ledger. Um, we, it is an option to store on the ledger, but in, in general, we're storing off ledger. So I do want to point out two things here. Um, the technology is designed to work with any repository. So we are imagining that the original content is, is, is stored in a repository, uh, whether it's a you know, commercial product like SharePoint, Google Drive, or some other tools. Now, 
when you see uh, Charlie, Joe, and each get their own copy of the document, those documents are really generated outside. They are not really um, stored anywhere on the server. So the content is stored in the repository of Ledger, but the actual container, we call container document, that's the term we use for the actual HTML file generated and with X currently embedded in. Those container documents are actually stored, I mean, uh, generated on the fly for specific users so that they can be accessed. Thank you. Um, our next question, which is uh, somewhat related from Chuck, are the documents stored on the blockchain or just the metadata? Um, for now, just metadata. Thanks. Our next question is from Neil. What would you anticipate will be the most difficult barriers to break in order to implement and scale blockchain for security in the DoD environment? Huh. Um, I'll give a shot. I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person. I'll give a shot here. I think that there are several um, from a there are technology barriers, there are culture barriers, there are other barriers as well. From a technology standpoint, I think we need to show that this can be integrated with existing infrastructures including the cloud um, infrastructure that DoD has. We need to show that this can be integrated with the repository. So that's why we place extra, extra emphasis on integration with external repositories. And we talk about integration with external repository, you're talking about really, you know, a lot of different aspects, identity management, you're talking about document access and all that. That's one uh, technology standpoint. I think there are also other um, barriers from, you know, a security certification from, um, you know, what kind of rules and regulations we need to follow, as well as uh, cultural barriers here, because we are talking about collaboration across organizational boundaries. I think those are the things that we need to consider and as we uh, implement and uh, scale the technology. Great, thank you. Our next question from Bob. MT Connect 2.0 is just released. Any thoughts of potentially using SysML based models versus PDF in your framework? <laughs> um, that's definitely something we can do. Um, right now, we're using PDF because that is really the most uh, widely used document format for repository. Now, if you look at the a variety of document format, I, well, SysML, I assume you're talking about probably XMI or things of that nature. Um, yes, we can definitely um, look into that um, because if you look at the technology, really there are two different pieces that we're looking at. First is the access control part, um, then there's distributed enforcement part. Uh, I think supporting different formats really has more to do with packaging the in different uh, container document to support view and access distributed from the browser. But right now we're we're doing PDF. Um, you know, if if there's a need to support other artifacts like systeml based models, uh, whether it's XMI or others, we can definitely talk about them. Thanks. Next question from Garrett. Can you explain how a document can be restored in a ransomware scenario after total data loss of a copy? Um okay. Um uh, so this one of the things that um, you, you can one of the um, weakness that is exploited by ransomware is, as we mentioned, the centralized managed IT infrastructure. Right, you have a system administrator that is responsible for maintaining and setting policies for organization. And that policy is replicated across your organization infrastructure. Um, and what we're doing here is to make sure that the documentation, the documents and data is replicated and distributed beyond that boundary using something like distributed file system. Now, in that case, um, even if one organization is compromised, one administrative password is compromised, we still have the ability to get a copy uh, and recover from a backup somewhere else. That is, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit of decentralization. Obviously, there are uh, more technical details that we can discuss, uh, but that's, that's the idea.
Our next question for Bob, does the framework enable document content collaboration? Um, not sure. Uh, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong here, when you say document content collaboration, you're talking about uh, concurrent changes of a document or annotating the document here. Um, we, because we do not support, we do not have a centralized copy, and that's really the intent. Each copy is personalized with personal access policy embedded. So we don't have a centralized policy, a centralized copy where everybody work on. Um, so if you're looking for collaboration, you know, where uh, I'm talking about a uh, collaboration to like Google Drive or SharePoint where uh, everybody can see everybody's change in real time, that's not one of our objectives here. But um, really depends on the embedded capability. You see a PDF renderer over there uh, in, in our uh, demo here. Really, uh, I think that kind of capability can be provided by the by the PDF rendering framework uh, to a certain extent. But we're our goal is not for real time. Uh, you know, seeing each other change in real time. Uh, our next question from Chuck, referring to the demo where a PDF document was presented. How is the document tracked and protected when it's distributed outside of the demo system and okay. open using Adobe Reader? For yeah, example, that's a great, PDF is emailed to another user. That is a great question. Uh, and, and and the reason you can't do that is we're not actually sending PDF. Um, the document you've seen here uh, in the browser is actually an HTML file with content encrypted. So if you save um, this file, what you save is encrypted HTML. That, that's all it is. And it cannot be opened by Adobe Browser uh, Reader because it's not a PDF. Great, thank you. Our next question from Partha, I may have missed it. How are you preventing a registered user from downloading the PDF to his or her local disk and sending it by email? The register um, can no. also use print screen to screenshot the PDF pages. Can he? So a couple, couple points here. Um, so no, the first question is no. Um, the user cannot download the PDF, as I answered in the previous question. What the what is saved in the user's computer is an HTML file. Um, it cannot be opened with uh, uh, Adobe Reader, for example. Now, uh, can the user use print screen and share it? Uh, I guess theoretically it can. What, what, what he cannot do is he cannot print out the PDF. He cannot save the PDF. But I guess, you know, if he takes the camera, of, you know, just take a screen, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a possibility that, that we cannot prevent. Uh, but, you know, but it's, uh, I think it's it, it just add a layer of protection there. Um, same same thing going back to the music example here, right? So if if you 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 play music in the player here, and nothing prevents you from, you know, playing on a computer and record it uh, using a you know, device outside the printer and then redistribute it. But then what you're losing is you know losing the quality, you're losing a lot of things, and and the watermark there really have another layer of protection just to. Um, as a, as a warning and deterrence for illegal distribution. So the question really twofold. Uh, first, uh, you can't. Second is you don't have an easy way to do it, but then of course, if you go to the lens of you know taking a screenshot from other tools outside the browser, you can, but and that, that will have a degraded quality and you had to put them together in a way that makes sense. Just start create a lot of uh, um, challenges for people who try to uh, do this. Thank you. And um, we also have a question from James in the attendee chat. Does the capability support published DOD IC metadata formats when importing each file? I say it can because we do have a lot of document metadata embedded. Right now, we're using standards such as Dublin Core. But um, really, there are different um, metadata we can, can put in um, and publish on the blockchain. There is, there is very customizable. Okay, thank you. Uh, that That's all the questions that were submitted. I know that we did receive a related technical inquiry 
um, related to this upcoming uh, webinar um, that spoke to other solutions in the space. Um, when, if you could, could you talk a little bit about, um, I'm not sure how much market research you guys have done at this point, but other uh, potential competing solutions in the space. Um, you know, we, we are aware of, you know, secure rooms and things like that, where you have to log in via credentials and that is a quote unquote safe space, but that doesn't necessarily have the attribution effects of uh, the document distribution that you talked about today. But um, if you could talk to um, potential other solutions in the space and what kind of differentiates um, um, Legend. Okay, so I'll, I'll say two things here. Um, so first is the use of um, HTML file container documents we call. Um, now, if you, some solutions use uh, like online copy, authority copy of this, um, but that that is still very much a repository centric view, if you will, right? So um, that is you know, not not most people typically do. Most people typically do is to look at this PDF file and attach it to email and send it over instead of going to that repository and you know create another copy or or somehow following repository specific forwarding uh, scenario to do it. So I think by allowing the distribution of file content onto the recipient's de desktop or laptop. Uh, using HTML file is one of the things that we're trying to do here. Um, so from a, that's from a technology standpoint. Um, and then, you know, also from a technology standpoint is the association and implementation of access control. Continuous access control is really the term here. Access control embedded in that document versus somewhere else, like in a repository. Uh, thank you know, so because, you know, once you document leave a repository, you can never be sure what happens to it. So the only way you can assure that you have control, you have insight is to have that document uh, control policy metadata associated with that document. So I think those are the two things I would point out. Package the thing that can be downloadable and forwardable, which is, you know, the standard, normal, common scenario people do when they forward the documents and the ability to implement continuous access control within the document itself. All right, thank you. We do have a follow-up question from James. He asks, are there limits to using this approach in disconnected environments? Yes, there is. So, um, but we, we do support disconnected environment too. Um, it, 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 there are different kind of um, access control and security um, your ability here. So you can do certain things within the document itself in a disconnected environment. And uh, we have to have a, have a mode that enables that um, versus, but you just have a broader kind of capabilities in a more enterprise environment. So our technology supports both, but at a different level of security assurance. Perfect. Um, I'm monitoring the chat and the questions as of right now, I believe that is, everyone's questions uh, that was answered. Um, if you do have further questions uh, for CSI or for when, um, do not hesitate to reach out. You can use the contact alias or you can email me directly. We'll get you all the information you need necessary. Um, but with that said, that concludes today's webinar. Um, please do keep in mind that we do have another webinar for June. We actually have two this month. Um, we rescheduled one from April, so I believe it's June 29th. Um, on do it do it yourself AI, um, and we do have a quick question that came in. Uh, yes, this the recording of this presentation will be up on YouTube within a couple of days. Please check back at the CSI website. Um, go to the webinar page, and there will be a a link there for you to to watch this replay. All right. With that said, I'd like to thank Wen. Um, this thank was you, a, Phil. It was a great webinar. We had a uh, a lot of interaction. So um, we'll try to see if we can get more content related to blockchain as uh, this was very interesting to our to our uh, our membership. Uh, thank you. And we'll see you uh, hopefully at the uh, next webinar in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everybody.